first date of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early in the morning, while it was still dark, and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Mary stayed outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she went over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and the other one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, Women, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she said, had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Women, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the garden and said to him, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them, I'm going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced it to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and then reported what he told her, the Gospel of the Lord. Mary Magdalene, St. Mary Magdalene, is a converted. I believe that all the early Christians are converted. Converted in the sense that they met Christ, and they converted from the life they led, in some cases, or from the faith they had. Mary Magdalene was a convert from the life she led. Others, she were intellectual converts, as St. Paul, for example. She, we don't know very well. The biblical scholars have not agreed. We do know her very well who she was other from the fact that she was from the city of Magdala, possibly in the surrounding of the Lake of Tiberias. But we don't know if she was a prostitute, as tradition says, or a sick person from whom the Lord spelled seven demons. We don't know. But she was a convert in the sense that when she met Jesus, she changed her life. I repeat, we don't know if she was a life of sin, a life of sickness. She changed her life and realized how much she owed to the person who had rescued her from the kind of life she led, whatever was a health problem or a sin problem. Converse, at least moral converts, I believe that also the intellectual converts are very grateful people. They are aware of what they had and what they have, where they came from and where they are. Perhaps those who have always lived in faith do not realize what a gift they have. They have always had it, and like a child in a rich house, have enjoyed comforts all their lives and does not know what it means to be without them. But the one who comes from conversion, I repeat, moral as well as intellectual, knows very well how cold it is outside, how bad it is, the anguish, the damage done by sin, the uncertainty, and he is grateful. The convert is a humble person. Moreover, he knows not only what he has received, but he knows that he does not deserve it. Who am I, Lord, for you should come into my house? Mary Magdalene and all the others, I think of Matthew the publican, and Simon the Zealot, could say these words of the Roman centurion 
And they said it, Who am I, Lord? For you should come into my house. I don't deserve you, Lord. I need you. I thank you. And I thank you all the more and more. I'm aware that I don't deserve you, that I have no right to your love, that I have no right that you look me in the eyes and tell me that you love me, that I have no right that you have given your life for me. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. This is the characteristic of the convert, I repeat, that those who are lifelong Christians, sometimes at least, some of them have a harder time having, and it is something that we should all learn. Lord, thank you. And I want my life to be a praising Him, a thanksgiving Him. My life, that is, that is to save my heart, in my words, I thank you, Lord, because I don't deserve your love, but I need it. But then there is something else in this gospel in which the appearance of the Lord to the Magdalene is told, which is very caring. This woman who loved Jesus with this grateful love, who experienced and had experienced Jesus or her Savior, However, she had no faith. I suppose that she too, like the apostles, had heard that on the third day he was going to raise again, but she had no faith. She loved for Jesus. She collaborated in the descent, descended in the cleaning scheme of the dreadful blood that covered his destroyed body. She had gone the morning to Easter morning to continue with the task of embalsing that she had to do it in haste. She loved Jesus, gratitude, but she did not have faith. And that is why she says this phrase. She says it to Jesus without recognizing Him. A sign the glorious body, the resurrected body, is not the same as the body at the moment we died. But no matter how disfigured the corpse was, she could not recognize him. He will rec she will recognize him instead curiously by his voice, because the voice is something that changes much less in adults throughout life. But when she did not recognize him, she asked him, believing that he is the gardener, they have taken away my Lord, and we do not know where they put him. This is a phrase that many Catholics say today. They have taken away my Lord, and we don't know where they have placed Him. What a pain there is behind this phrase in the Magdalene and in Catholics. Perhaps they are not aware of what they are experiencing, but expressing it very well. Where is Jesus? Where have they placed Jesus? I'm against the removal of the tabernacle from the temples. They say the concilium ordered it, but I have not seen any document or the concilium that said the tabernacle had to be removed from the temple. It is necessary to give importance to the altar, but that doesn't mean that the tabernacle had to be removed from the church. When a late faithful enters a church, usually on Sunday, most of them, where is Jesus? There is a side chapel, sometimes even a separate building in a side chapel, a small side chapel, where most of those faithful will not enter. They do not see Jesus. They do not see the red light that has existed all their lives next to the tabernacle and they indicate that Christ is there. They did not see Jesus. This is just a small example. And then in practicing, they often talk about everything but Christ. The love of Christ. The love to Christ. The love of eternal life. They often talk about politi politics in one sense or another and about other things that are important. 
charity, helping the poor, all of that. But where is Jesus? How to inflame the heart of that person to love the Lord and for the love of the Lord to love his neighbor? Sometimes I have had the impression that the Protestant radius, radio stations in Latin America talk more about Christ than Catholic radio stations. And not only in Latin American, soccer is much, much important in the Word of God. When it comes to choosing the broadcasting sector that reaches more people, where is the Lord? What is the church? What sense does it have, if not to show the face of Christ, to worship Christ, to praise Christ, to thank Christ, to live for Christ? What sense has a humanist church that has forgotten that the objective for which was founded to give glory to God? Such glory to God, naturally, as Jesus Christ has taught us, passes through the love of our neighbor. The Apostle James is clearly in his letter, You cannot love the God you don't see. If you don't love your neighbor that you see. But to forget that the first thing is to love God means that we leave God for a neighbor we don't know in the in the of the Magdalene, which is the questions of millions of Catholics or millions is a question that needs an answer. They have taken the Lord away, and I don't know where they have placed Him. Christ is alive. Christ is risen. Christ is in the tabernacle. Christ is in the Eucharist. And Christ is also in the brother who needs your help. Because it is Christ who says to you, I have hungry and you have fed me, or you have not fed me. But Christ is alive in the Eucharist to be adorated, to fall on our knees full of gratitude, to say to the Lord with our hearts, in our hands, without you, Lord, I will have sunk. What could become of my life without you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. Eternally thank you, Lord. Amen.